Hi, my name is Andy Robbins. I'm one of the co-creators of Bloodhound. In this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about Bloodhound Community Edition. What is that? So back in 2016, we released Bloodhound. So we have here the uh, Bloodhound repository, which to this moment has been private. We're just gonna go ahead and uh, YOLO this right now. Uh-oh, this is bad. That free and open source version of our software continues and is now known as Bloodhound Community Edition to distinguish it from Bloodhound Enterprise. This release is the culmination of several months of effort on behalf of our engineering team to converge those code bases. So the two products actually share a common code base now. That convergence brings many, many improvements to Bloodhound, including a new GUI, a new API, improved cipher searches, user management, cache query results, a whole lot more that we're gonna talk about in this video. Let's go. Bloodhound CE has a completely rebuilt API. And as you can see, it is served in a web interface. So if you have a browser, you can access the Bloodhound CE GUI. So I wanna show you just a couple things. Uh, I'm not gonna show you everything because there's way too much, but some of the highlights. Let's search for a user. Let's search for Steve Draper 00168. There he is. And what I wanna show you is some things you'll notice right off the bat. The information about the node is actually over here on the right, not over on the left. We do this because in Bloodhound Enterprise, there are a lot of features that we have to have proper screen real estate for. And we've found that this layout is much better for that. So you'll see benefits of, of that new layout in Bloodhound CE as well. But some of the typical things that you would recognize are here. We have all the different object information. Now, instead of the right click, of your mouse being hijacked by Electron, you can actually right click and copy just like you expect to be able to do when you're looking at a web application. Results of each query on the right hand side in this entity panel, they will be drawn in the graph rendering area if it's not too many nodes to draw, but then also the results that are relevant to the query will be presented uh, in a table view uh, under the accordion item header here as well. So here are the computers that this user has a session on. We can also look at the uh, groups that this user belongs to. So there are seven, including some that are through group nesting. And all seven of those groups are listed here as well. And let's look at local admin privileges. So at a certain point, there start to be you know, some some problems with how many nodes are being drawn on the screen. And if you've been using Bloodhound for any time, you've seen this where, you know, I can't really easily see what all these different computers are just at a glance. But now with this list here on the right, it's way easier to just scroll through the results here See if you see a computer that stands out based on a name, or maybe you know about something as far as maybe the OU placement or the operating system of that computer to then inform the next step in your attack path. Let's go up to one of these computers that this user has admin rights on. Let's just pick a random one. Let's pick this one right here. So if we click on this, that draws the node. And then if we click on the node, then that will update the entity panel. So now we're looking at information about this computer. Same information that you would expect to see. Operating system, SID, FQDN of the domain it belongs in, sessions, things like that. Who are the local admins on that computer? Uh, you can see it there. And again, you can have a nice, easy to read list uh, for all of these different things as well. Pathfinding. Pathfinding works very similarly to how it worked with Legacy Bloodhound. So we have this computer already selected. Let's see if it has a path to domain admins. If it doesn't, I know another one that does. Okay, no path found. 02556. And let's look at the paths from that computer to domain admins. Again, renders basically instantaneously. 
Um, I also want to show you how the interface handles when too many nodes will be attempted to be drawn. And the, the long and the short of it is that right now we just don't, we don't draw them. However, you do still need to see the results of these queries. So let's take domain admins, for example, outbound object control 5,504. If you think about it, drawing 5,500 dots on the screen doesn't really tell you a whole lot. It doesn't really help you get your job done, but you still need the information. Instead of clicking this and then the GUI saying, do you wanna draw the results or not? You will see the results of that query. So you do get to see what are all the different objects that domain admins has control of. One of the big challenges with Legacy Bloodhound was the architecture didn't allow us to put performance improvement capabilities in the application, such as cached query results. So in the Legacy Bloodhound interface, let's say you pull up the domain admins group and let's say you look at first degree object control. Every time you load this entity panel, which you do by clicking on the node, these queries get run every single time. If these queries take 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds or longer to run, they do that every single time you click on one of those nodes. In Bloodhound Community Edition, the results of those queries are now cached. On a lot of objects, for example, the domain admins group, the results of that query are pre-cached for you. If you click on something else, like let's say I click on a user and I see it's got local admin rights on 48 computers, outbound object control on 5,500 computers. So these queries, they're faster than legacy Bloodhound. And also the results of these, query, of these queries are cached. So subsequent times that you look at this object's entity panel and you're looking at this information, you're actually gonna see the cached results of that query from when it ran before. So one of the features that we've completely overhauled is the raw cipher input feature. So in the GUI, you have the ability to write up your own cipher. And currently, if the output is going to return nodes, edges, or paths, then the graph rendering, rendering area will draw the results of that query. So I wanna show you a couple of examples and I wanna show the difference in performance of this feature from Legacy Bloodhound, which you'll, you'll see the, the pretty significant difference there. Starting at the search uh, box, you go to Cypher and this box here, you can resize. Um, you can see stored queries by opening this little uh, folder icon here. And the common searches that you're used to seeing in Legacy Bloodhound are here. I'm gonna run a very simple query, which is just returning one node from the database. And running that query looks very simple, but actually a lot of really complicated things are happening under the hood uh, to protect the application from cipher injection attacks and also to protect the application from very, very long running queries. This is a very simple example of just returning one node. And instead of just returning one, we could return 10, uh, we could return, uh, we could return 100. And it's at this point that I wanna start showing you the difference in performance from Bloodhound Community Edition and Legacy Bloodhound. So running that same query that I just ran to draw 100 nodes, I'm gonna hit enter on this. You'll see that the application starts to do its layout and that took, I don't know, four or five seconds. I'm gonna increase this to 200 and what you're gonna see is this is gonna take about 20 seconds to finish. And so Neo4j has already returned the data back to Legacy Bloodhound's interface. And now all the work is being done in JavaScript to lay out these nodes in a layout. With Legacy Bloodhound, this takes about 20 seconds to complete. In Bloodhound Community Edition, the same query, it finishes almost instantaneously. I wouldn't even try 
to render like a thousand nodes in Legacy Bloodhound. But doing that in Bloodhound Community Edition, so let's increase this to a thousand. It's pretty easy. So that took maybe a quarter second to render. So the difference in performance is significant. We can see uh, some other examples of Cypher commands that are very basic and also how quickly the interface lays those out. So let's return some very basic node to node patterns and we'll just return the first one that comes back. And that draws pretty much instantaneously. Let's increase this to 10, same thing, 100, same thing. Let's go to 1,000, same thing. So these graphs that used to take up to 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour for the legacy GUI to render will now be rendered by Bloodhound Community Edition way faster in a matter of milliseconds or seconds. With Bloodhound Community Edition, we now have the ability to do proper user management, SAML authentication, and even MFA. So let me show you an example. Uh, and so here in the interface, I'm logged in as my admin user and I'll click on the cog wheel and go to administration. Over here on the left, I've got users. So I'll click on manage users and this will list out the users in my Bloodhound instance. I've got my default admin account here. And so we can create an account. Let's say I wanna give Jeff access to my instance. So I'll click on create user, email address, say jdimmick at specterops.io. Principal name, jdimmick. First name, Jeff. Last name, Dimmick. Authentication method, username, password. And initial password, just give him a good old password, one, two, three, bang. Uh, we'll say he needs to change his password the first time he logs in as well. We also have role management here. So there are four different roles built in. Read only, exactly what it sounds like. Upload only, exactly what it sounds like. A user is uh, able to look at everything in the database. Uh, they're able to do any query. They're able to access any endpoint. Um, however, they can't do any administrative actions. So they can't reset somebody else's password. They can't create users. Uh, they can't wipe the database, uh, for example. All of that and everything else is reserved for any user that has the administrator role. So we'll give Jeff the user role, save. And now Jeff has access to our Bloodhound instance um, after he changes his password. Of course, in here, we can also change the, the password ourselves. Uh, we can also generate an API token for the user, which we'll talk about later. Um, disable the user, delete the user, like your typical user management functions. We're also introducing SAML authentication. If your identity provider can speak SAML, then you can do user management in that identity provider, connect it to Bloodhound Community Edition, and then you're good to go. One more thing is if I click on the cog wheel up here and I go to my profile, I can also turn on two-factor authentication for my user. And so we support TOTP authentication, which you can do with like Duo, Microsoft Authenticator, whatever else. Everything you've seen so far in the GUI has all been served by the brand new Bloodhound API. To get started, you will come to administration and in your user's interface, you will create an API token. So I'll create one for the admin user. I've already got some made. Let's look at what it looks like to create a new one. Create token. And we'll say this is my very cool token, save. And now you have a token key and a token ID. This will only be displayed one time. The endpoint that returns this information will not return this information again on subsequent calls. So make sure you copy and paste this now before you move on. The Bloodhound API is self-documenting with Swagger Docs. Click on this little cog wheel and go to API Explorer. You'll see this automatically generated Swagger documentation. So as an example, 
you can look at uh, the computer entity API. And so getting a computer entity info with the API, expand this, and then it will tell you what the URI parameters are that you need to supply, well, if they're required or not. And we'll show you what an example response looks like as well, and then what the uh, what the property types are, what the properties are, what the property types are from the response. And you can try it just in this interface here. So this is gonna be very helpful for understanding what API endpoints are available and how to call them and what the output looks like, what you should expect from the output. So in this first example, what I'm gonna do is specify a couple variables. I have my token key and my token ID. And I'm going to call the search endpoint and I'm gonna do a query for any node where the name or the object ID contains Steve. It's as simple as this, where my invoke BHE request, this is a commandlet that does all the work for you of putting the request together, making sure that it has the right headers, and then putting the output of that request into this search request variable. And then we can access those results by accessing the variable. And here we have our JSON formatted output. So there is one, one result, here's the object ID, here's the type, it's a user, here's the name. And from this endpoint, we don't have a distinguished name. It's probably also an artifact of this being a fake data set created by our graph gen uh, capability. What if I wanna look at who are all the local admins on a computer? Maybe the GUI can't display that very well because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of results. So there is a computers slash admin users endpoint in that URI after the SID for the computer, we say, I wanna access admin users endpoint. We can see the results again by uh, just accessing it with PowerShell. You have SID, name, label, and you can pass that on to some other tool. You can pipe it to another uh, Bloodhound API endpoint if you want to. You can work with this data outside the confines of the GUI. And that's it. So thank you for watching this video about Bloodhound CE. This is an early access build. There are gonna be some bugs. We know about some of them. Some of them I'm sure we don't know about. So please start to use it and let us know. Come hang out with us in the Bloodhound Slack. Uh, or let us know in a GitHub issue if you see things that need a little more polish or if you run into an issue. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much all I have to say. We're really excited. We're really eager to get your feedback. And we are really excited about the future of Bloodhound. So thanks for watching this video. And I hope you have a great day.